In this episode, you'll learn how you can design services that your customers just can't stop using because they help them to express who they are and what they stand for. Some really powerful stuff. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Claire Dennington. This is the Service Design Show, episode 177. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden and invisible things that make a difference between success and failure? All to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Claire Dennington. Claire has obtained a PhD from the Oslo School of Architecture and Design in 2021. On a PhD thesis titled Refashioning Service Design, Designing for Popular Culture Service Experiences. Now, the reason I'm excited to have Claire on the show with us today is this. There are many famous products that have influenced our culture in a very significant way. Here are a few examples that come to mind. Obviously the iPhone, Tesla, the Nike Air Jordans. And what about the Volkswagen Beetle, the Game Boy and the Hawaiiana flip flops. All of these products have become on to become legendary category defining icons. And these products don't have customers. Oh no, they have fans and ambassadors. What makes these products special is that somehow they have been able to create and deliver meaning for their customers beyond the functional aspects of the product. These products help people to express their identity and values in one way or the other. Which of these examples speaks to you says something about who you are and what you stand for. But somehow we rarely discuss how to leverage pop culture in our service design process. And that feels like a missed opportunity when you look at the power it has to create meaning and value for our customers. Well, that's where Claire comes in. Through her PhD, Claire has looked into how we can use trends in pop culture to design services. Now, maybe I'm biased, but I find this an extremely inspiring topic, one that opens up a whole new world of opportunities. So if you stick around till the end of this episode, you'll know what we actually mean by pop culture and what its relationship is to trends, why the recent service-oriented brands like Netflix, Uber, and Airbnb are becoming our new pop culture icons, and of course, how you can use this powerful design material to deliver meaningful services. Whether you're working with a local fitness gym or a large financial institution. I hope this got you excited because now it's time to sit back, relax and enjoy the conversation with Claire Dennington. Welcome to the show, Claire. Thank you, Mark. Nice to have you on. We're going to discuss a topic that hasn't been discussed in the previous 176 episodes. So I'm really excited about this. But before we jump in, I would love to uh, know a bit more about you and your context, what you do. So could you give us a, like a 30 second pitch? Who is Claire? Okay, well, I'm a service designer and a PhD and I'm based in Oslo. I recently joined Shipstead Nordic Marketplaces, where I'm working as a UX manager. And I guess before that, I've been working a lot with um, design-driven innovation and circular service uh, design uh, within the fashion and lifestyle industry. Cool. Now, uh, five questions. I have a lightning round that I haven't prepared you for. Just okay. the first thing that comes to your mind to get mm -hmm. to know you mm -hmm. as a person next to the professional. Are you ready? Yes. All right, Claire. What's always in your fridge? Oh, always in my fridge, um, oat milk. 
oat milk. All yes. right. Stay, staying in the food category, mm -hmm. what is the best meal you've ever had? A uh, good question. I've had so many good meals, but I think uh, definitely eating like uh, dim sum in Chinatown in London would be one of the best meals. <laughs> All right. Uh, which book are you reading right now, if any? Uh, yes, I'm reading. Um, I've just recently finished actually a Norwegian novel uh, by a Norwegian author um, called uh, I Am the Wolf, Jair Ulven which has been yeah, very interesting discussing growing up in Norway as a um, second generation um, immigrant and the family, sort of how the family has yeah, experienced. Next question is, if you could work from anywhere in the world, which place would you pick? I would probably pick somewhere that has a beach and a nice uh, ocean to swim in. Uh, no specific, specific place, but uh, yes. Somewhere hmm. that you could like hang around on the beach as well. Hanging around on the beach sounds like yeah. a great a plan. And the fifth and final question is uh, also a tradition here on the show. Do you remember the first time you got in touch with service design? Yes, I did actually, because I was studying um, industrial design at the uh, Oslo School of Architecture and Design. So it probably was 2005 or something. And we had a course with um, Simon Clatworthy who sort of introduced, I would say, a lot of service design to the Norwegian community. And I just thought it was uh, so interesting and mm. like a great, uh, great introduction to service mm. design at that time. It's in, uh, interesting that most people do remember the first moment they learned about service design. Mm -hmm. I do as well. So yeah. uh, cool. Thank you for this uh, introduction into who Claire is and where she would like to spend her days. Yeah. Um, Claire. We're going to talk about um, you. You phrased it as trends as mm -hmm. design material, or at least that's one of the ways you phrased it. And I liked it a lot because mm -hmm. uh, I think I got reference to you by one of the previous guests, yes. Pat Matthews, that's who right. you also know. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, the topic in that episode was rituals as a design material. So I thought, yeah. well, hmm, that looks pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is completely new to me. So um, you have done a PhD related to this topic, to trends, yes. to pop culture. Um, maybe can you give us some context? Like how did this all start for you? It started with a personal interest. I've always been interested, I guess, in popular cultural expressions and how this, you know, influences us. I've been um, both working and interested in the sort of lifestyle sector and lifestyle industry where popular culture is a huge part of it. And then I've um, been in, I guess, like coming from working in different sectors, like the fashion industry, for example, where you would use trends as a material to kind of design your products. And I saw that maybe that was something that had potential also in service design. Now, I'm an old man. I'm starting to get really old. Pop culture. Mm -hmm. um, I have some assumptions and ideas yes. about what that might be. Mm -hmm. But how do you define pop culture? What is it? What is it to you? I would say it's sort of... Um, this, this, uh, the way of how we kind of do things in a contemporary view, it's sort of this um, entanglement of meaning and materiality and social practices uh, of our everyday lives. Um, and uh, of course, like you could say, popular culture is also quite, could be quite tied to, um, entertainment or sort of you know a lot of people think about American popular culture and I think it doesn't necessarily have to be that but it's more about how we yeah how we sort of do things how what we value what are our norms of uh, current um, current times when you close your eyes and think about pop culture what is it that you see like what are some images that come to your mind Hmm. I would say definitely um, today brands, lots of uh, established, I would say, pop cultural lifestyle brands would come to mind. Um, I would see sort of, uh, well, good question. Um, 
most sort of, you could say, aesthetic images, sort of like something conveying some kind of um, feeling. Like what? Can like what? What is what is uh, part of pop culture for you right now? And stereotypical example. Um, well, one thing is probably like uh, definitely how we consume media these days. Um, we are sort of, you know, getting used to shorter and shorter uh, information chunks or uh, a mix of sort of images and short texts, which has become quite a part of how, yeah, at least the younger generation is uh, consuming media or um, the way we... Uh, watch a series and talk about series you know that's something we all discuss around the lunch mm. table what's happening that's part of popular culture you always on but of course you have like other expressions like it could be music or it could be movies um so uh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, i'm starting to get an image and mm -hmm. the thing i'm still curious about is Culture versus pop culture, just yeah. to help me understand, like, yeah. uh, is is there a difference? And if so, what is the difference? <laughs> that's, a, that's a huge question. I, I, um, I think basically maybe popular, popular culture is more localized in some ways. So you can have sort of very small units where, where that shared practices or shared values create this sort of um, culture, which, you know, you'd start moving into subcultures, but there's all these different layers of popular culture. So maybe popular culture would be defined as something that, you know, um, most people can relate to or something that is uh, um, in people's minds at the moment. That, that makes sense. Um, before we uh, dig into how this applies to services, mm -hmm. how are we seeing pop culture being used in other industries? So maybe like the, that's uh, you mentioned fashion, but I can imagine also products. Yes. How are we seeing it there? I think uh, definitely, as you said, uh, in product design, it's really um, the, the way of how designers i would say are interpreting interpreting uh, the kind of um, meaning i would say uh, behind these trends or within popular culture and kind of translating this into the products meaning that as users we um we would choose products because they have some kind of significant uh, meaning for us. And I think a lot about, you know, uh, practically, if you look to fashion or you look to product um, design, a way of sort of capturing this is to, um, you know, identify different popular culture expressions and sort of use this uh, as a material, then you would use it as inspiration or you would use it to trigger some kind of concept or um, something that uh, um, resonates, I would say, with with users and, and their current sort of uh, values and aspirations. When you think about uh, maybe uh, icons from other industries, like around products and uh, fashion and I don't know, other, other examples, what are some of the first examples that come to mind or when people document or write or, or create videos about pop culture and products? Like, what are the examples that they always pick out? If we stay in sort of, I would say, product and lifestyle, definitely, uh, you know, Apple products would be pulled forwards as very sort of significantly different, perhaps, than computers and sort of that kind of technology sector was looking before Apple came and, and introduced a completely sort of new way of um, designing products. And I think in the fashion industry, you have uh, brands like Adidas that have had a huge um, impact with, you know, certain shoe models like three stripes or something that has been taken up into popular culture. We have uh, bands like seeing about it, referencing it. So this sort of like continuous um, interplay you could say between popular culture and products so yeah i think those can be two examples okay okay now um i was thinking about this topic and um trends as a design material or mm. culture as a design material mm. and i was thinking like aren't uh, we always 
maybe subconsciously or intentionally designing with culture in mind like uh, our solutions of course need to align with the needs and desires of our users mm -hmm. but if they don't align with the culture they won't work either so um like are we doing this already and if so if if we aren't like what's missing where did you mm -hmm. see the opportunity mm -hmm. I think that's a very good question because it comes down to perhaps what you're saying, if it's intentionally or unintentionally, it's like some designers would intuitively kind of um, uh, design, um, as you said, we pop the culture as a part of their repertoire or, you know, but, but um, I think also some parts of service design is, uh, of course, if you're um, designing for um, for example, um, redesigning and making services better and using a lot of, uh, of course, really importantly, user insights to, to improve service experiences. But I think with what popular culture sort of did, um, uh, being aware of how you can use this also to design for future needs, right? So when we talk about trends or we talk about being able to identify uh, patterns perhaps you could also try to um, design new service offerings that are answering to future needs so it might not be that these are things that users know at the moment they need but it's more about um, yeah anticipating what might become valuable or what might be important for users in the near future and that's sort of tied into that uh, notion of um, innovation like trends as an innovation material so we can yeah i get that because when uh, you look at trends you're almost forecasting or sort yes. of projecting mm. a direction where yeah. groups are going desires are going habits needs uh so yeah designing for future makes makes sense i was um another question i had mm. i had a lot of questions yeah. about this topic so yeah <clears throat> how could we recognize a service or a product that isn't designed with pop culture in mind? So I, I th let me explain this question a bit more. Yeah. Often it's really hard to pinpoint specific aspects of uh, uh, something that is designed, a product or a service, like, okay, that one is designed with the user needs in mind because like da da da, -da. It's mm -hmm. More often it's way easier to say, okay, this service hasn't been designed with the user in mind because, I don't know, waiting Absolutely. times. Uh, yeah. it, like the, the ergonomics of the service or product don't work. Mm -hmm. So the question again is how do we recognize services or products that haven't been designed with pop culture in mind with mm. trends in mind i would say perhaps for products if we start there you would have um a lot of products that are uh, based on sort of functional needs so it it solves a, f a functional something you need to do right so you would have i'll use an example uh, from earlier which is kitchen products right so you would have kitchen products and you would it would do, do the job and then you kind of had this break in, in product design where the introduction of what is termed meaning innovation so you're not perhaps innovating on the function that the product has but it's more of like the meaning this product has for you and uh, yeah I don't know if you remember like the Italian kitchenware brand Alessi they did this whole range of you know uh, fun kitchen products uh, with bright colors and they had like humorous aspects to them and of course like um Philip Stark's uh, orange presser, which is like more like a sculpture and people would buy it to kind of display it, you know, in your living room and still has a function, but it's also something that you kind of, it's, you know, it, you could say desirable, but something that you want also because it, it resonates with you, with you and your sort of emotional needs, I would say. So I, I, I've tried to transfer that also notion into service design and we have lots of services that might be very functional they work 
um, and you would be happy when you use them because you get the job done. The offering, core offering is to help you solve the functional problem, but then you can also sort of, especially in some industry sectors and, you know, um, add a layer of this sort of popular culture um, so that touch points, so that tone of voice, so now all these uh, service details are aligned to the popular cultural sort of understanding. And I'm thinking like, what's the value? Why should you do this? Uh, mm -hmm. And I have an answer, but I'm also curious to your perspective. Yeah. So from a um, um, business standpoint, mm -hmm. if you are able to sort of distinguishing yourself based on function becomes mm. really hard and you don't mm. want to compete on price. Mm. So you need other layers yep. to distinguish your offerings, whether that's a product, whether that's a service. And using trends or using pop culture is you're tying into identity. Yep. And people buy products or services from you mm. because they are able to express their identity yes. through your offering yep. next to obviously doing the functional thing that it needs to do. But mm -hmm. uh, they're buying into much more, how does this make me feel? How does this yep. express who I am? Yep. And that's of course like opens a huge amount of uh, ways for businesses to uh, distinguish themselves. It, I don't know, how does that sound? Absolutely. I think you're very spot on. I think uh, that's one really interesting part of this is uh, um, especially again, sort of if you talk about lifestyle or fashion, it's uh, so interconnected with what you said, like identity creation and this notion of, you know, cultural capital. So as users, we might choose different products because they signify something about us, uh, but that could also be transferred uh, to you know services sign so why would we choose one service over the other as you said and it's more about um yes those um emotional aspects and i think sort of for me at least why this has been really important and something i've looked into is because i think that um in in looking into for example promoting more sustainable and circular um, consumption practices so that could be like instead of just buying products we could reuse them we could repair them we could sort of extend the life uh, life cycle of products we need to offer sort of service experiences that inspire us and that motivate us to choose this instead of choosing commercial you know new products so I think it has a lot of value in exploring this and also uh, trying to nudge people towards uh, changing um, practices, especially when it comes to consumption or how we use, you know, could be how we travel, could be in terms of micro mobility. So all of this like car sharing and these things, if we want people to start changing practices, then we have to, you know, uh, offer service experiences that feel valuable to us. Yeah, I'm more in line with who we are or who yeah. we want to be. And uh, exactly. yeah, it, the, the pull factor of a service that you recognize yourself in is going to be much more than a service that is sort of neutral, uh, but, yeah. but cheaper. Now, yeah. um, maybe um, uh, a thing that could worry people here is mm -hmm. Trends are often uh, associated also with things like fashion, um, yeah. where like it's the opposite of being sustainable. Mm. Uh, how do you see this? So, if we're designing with trends, um, mm -hmm. is like are we throwing sustainability overboard because next year there will be a different trend? If it was in products uh of course like uh, you are really contributing to that i think that in services it's, it's a bit opposite it would it would um allow us to to sort of design for new services you know new ways of doing things so especially in sort of product design i think um i've been working with um, several product companies like yeah, established brands and they still, a lot of them still struggling with having this product mindset, uh, whereas like trying to enable this movement to ex sort of more experience centric mindset where they actually can see the value a product has when you can um, 
say use it again or it comes back into the loop and it actually would um, result in uh, users for example if we're talking about economics paying for it twice like if you have a product and you can bring it back into the loop and you can repair it or you can um, use the materials to make it into something else or sort of understanding understanding sort of the product's life cycle beyond the point of purchase right because there's like this after phase what happens with the product after and if brands or if you know businesses are able to yes um make services that can uh, help uh, help um, products being used again for example it could rather contribute i think like we'll explore this uh a bit deeper mm. in a second mm. I'm, when when we say trends are a design material mm. could be seen as a design material just like mm. rituals for example mm. have you thought about the material properties of trends so if we have i don't know wood it can be strong it can be light it can be can have different colors those are the desired mm. uh, material properties have you identified material properties of trends and if so what are they um i haven't actually like specifically done that so that's really interesting i think just thinking of it now would be that trends are actually dynamic so that's quite unique I mean, it's something that would shift and change, like you said this now. And um, if we're thinking about services, it could be that the main service offering, so you would say like the product is the same, but the material or the trends or this sort of the way of how we deliver them or how they look and feel, for example, that could change. Um, so one thing is that it's dynamic. And I think also it's, if we could talk, more about sort of its, the emotional aspects, I suppose. It's more like an emotional material and meaningful. Um, and it's definitely, you know, intangible uh, versus the more tangible material qualities that you would have in product design. So it's not as easily definable. But um, yeah, I think that would perhaps be some of the qualities. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. interesting exercise to think about because if you understand the material properties of the design material, then you yeah. know what the things are that you can shape and influence yeah. and, and work on. Absolutely. You know, uh, thinking, about, thinking about shaping and influencing, um, I think one of the saying is often that products or, uh, yeah, products influence culture and culture influences products. Yeah. So, where does it start? How do you see this? Um, we put, I don't know, we put the iPod into the world and then it shapes culture, right? Yeah. It's an iconic thing. Yeah. Or was the iPod influenced by existing culture? And, and how, how do you see this interplay? I think uh, it's hard to perhaps define where it starts because it's such a sort of cyclical dynamic uh, entanglement and it, it kind of continuously kind of bounces off each other and uh, um, influences in both directions <laughs> so mm -hmm. necessarily see that it starts somewhere but I think perhaps like one one start would be the ability to kind of identify and articulate sort of what is happening, what are the patterns we are seeing and and what will this mean? Uh, how can we use that to, for example, um, yeah, innovate or design new services? Um, so I think, no, it's hard to say because you would see, you could see that often it would be, for example, some people, the early adopters or like the innovators, you know, would start doing something differently and then that would spread a bit and then you would see sort of um, perhaps brands or anybody picking up on this and trying to, yeah, maybe make it more popular. So it's sort of like this trickle effect as well, like we were talking about this now from subcultures to popular yeah. culture, like, yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. this sort of dynamic interplay all the time, I think. And when you mentioned subculture, I was mm. thinking like, so what What examples could I come up with that would maybe be a good example here? And um, Airbnb would for 
probably be an example of pop culture, yep. how we travel, how we Absolutely. explore the world. Um, but it started in a subculture. It yep. started which, with couch surfing, exactly. where people, like that was, you travel and you sort of hack the system by not going to a hotel, but actually finding a place to sleep on a, on a couch so, uh, somewhere. Yep. And then Airbnb very well capitalized on that and, and just made it bigger. So would you also consider that to be an example of a service that now is part of pop culture? Absolutely. I think that's a really good example. Um, and we could go, you know, um, further back to the practice of just like visiting friends, right? That's the feeling that Airbnb wanted to create was that you were, became a local and they started with doing all these small um touch points which enhance that sort of meaningful experience at least what i heard so they would like yeah make sure the host stocked up the fridge with the like, local delicacies and they would you know give you all the right tips to what you could do um i don't know if this is true but i i read some of that in because i think when it started in san francisco some of the first like hosts there were um they, they added like spare change, like coins, so that the people could um, give this to homeless people in San Francisco to really get the experience. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it was just like every sort of small detail was thought through to enhance and make this sort of a meaningful experience. So I think, no, I think that's a really good example. Other example, like really quickly, we get into the well-known brands and yeah. uh, Netflix, Uber, probably how we how we move around, how we get our food. Yeah. Netflix around consumption, media consumption, yeah. TikTok around consumption. Um, so those are maybe the more. Uh, I'm thinking that these are the newer types of service offerings. Mm -hmm. All of these three weren't here probably like ten years ago, fifteen years ago. Um, but are we seeing also examples? of more traditional services i don't know in banking or yes um absolutely i think uh, um there are lo a lot more banking options uh, now i think there's done a lot on of course like the user experience um that makes it easier for people to understand banking i know of a, 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 i think it's a british banking service that was designed uh, specifically for entrepreneurs, like creative entrepreneurs, to make it really understandable, like, you know, how taxes and everything works. And it was like really interactive and it was really visually appealing. So I think there's uh, things happening also in the traditional um, service sectors, uh, not everywhere, but at least um, some, some places. When things move, like when things move from subcultures to pop culture like mm. is there a next stage like do things is it, do things become mainstream and then sort of die out of being in the pop culture stage how does that work mm -hmm. i think in products uh, definitely if if you know if the if the provider isn't good at keeping up to date and sort of changing in line with the change we see um, and I think, you know, if we go back to Airbnb, like it's changed dramatically since it first started to now where they're offering like uh, experiences. They have these packages during COVID. They went over to uh, delivering um, online experiences, right? You can do virtual cooking classes. So it's about, it's still the same offering. So you're offering like a local um, hosting experience, but they can continuously manage to pull this into sort of uh, new directions seeing what's happening new which new trends and sort of implementing this mm. so i think you yeah you um, again like if you see trends in some sort of dynamic material you always be trying moving forward although your you know, core offering and your you know core values might be the same so, yeah <clears throat> and maybe we come back to the question where is this something that you want to be associated with and something that you want to be associated with today will probably evolve next year in five years in yeah. 10 years uh, i'm just just thinking about the cars we drive yes. like that has changed like maybe in the past you wanted a big suv 
Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, because that signals something to the outside mm -hmm. world. These days, the same people might want to be associated with a Tesla for the yeah. fact that they are probably that they are able to drive really fast, but they tell everybody that it's about the environment, but <laughs> it's dynamic. And what is mm -hmm. the thing that you want to be associated with? And yeah. No, absolutely. I think uh, that will shift, you know, it uh, it will be different. And I think um, Tesla is a really good example as well. Uh, if we go back to sort of this innovating through meaning and like how we sh how Tesla managed to shift like the meaning of electric cars from something that was sort of, you know, not not that cool, but very sort of sustainable. And then they they just made this completely new experience where Teslas were associated with, as you said, speed, you know, status. And so many, at least Norway, Teslas are super popular. And a lot of people didn't buy them because they were sustainable, right? It's like the, the identity creating part again. So, but of course that will change over time. I think it's interesting if we manage to, to use that in services so that you can associate with, for example, uh, more sustainable consumption practices, like by using this service, you know, I choose to um, be use secondhand clothing, I choose to use micro-mobility or green mobility, yeah, and then perhaps there are ways of sort of showing that or expressing that. Or just like uh, Tesla did, uh, it's almost a Trojan horse. Like you, you're you're doing things that are better for our environment, mm. but you're buying them for other reasons. Because yeah. I don't know, with with food, uh, I can imagine that it would just be a preference of taste. It tastes better, yeah. and it's better for the environment. Like right, mm. that's um, coming back to this question is, let's say somebody got super inspired by our conversation so far and they are think they are a service design professional working inside a large organization mm -hmm. never have thought about using trends mm -hmm. as a design material what would mm -hmm. be your tip what would be your tip to start like how do you mm -hmm. embed this in your day-to-day -day design practice um, well, I think, uh, first of all, sort of familiarize with the trends. Um, some organization would have trend units, so you could go to them and sort of get uh, five big trends to watch out for, and then you start doing research, I think is important, uh, meaning, of course, desktop research, there's a lot of trend resources, but also um, getting out and looking around and you know understanding what's happening you can often start to see these patterns right so you can see like what's uh, popular on for example netflix like what is this series actually about and then you can draw start seeing you know all people are wearing this what does that actually mean and then it becomes all these sort of small points that you you could practice connecting in some way and i think it's a lot about using your intuition as well to sort of be able to identify so i think that's sort of one start of it is identifying it and you can use sort of visual material you can mood boarding for example which use a lot in product design it can be used into service like to um convey the experience that you're trying to design for in a way and um articulating it i think like breaking it down to actually being able to say what does this trend mean like is it uh, about safety is it about uh, um convenience and what does that kind of look and feel like i think that's one thing and then um and then start sort of um using this into uh, the service journey so like into the touch points what would be a touch point that kind of resonates with popular culture now what is the tone of voice that is uh, um, sort of dominating this uh, industry sector or what would I like to how would I like this service to be conceived um, conceived um, and so I think sort of trying to find also these design tools that are visual that are helping you to break down do you know this meaning behind mm. and I, I also worked with uh, developing sort of like a tool called the experience 
experience centric service journey. So like one thing is mapping out a service journey, all the points, but then also adding a layer of sort of um, visual mapping. So it's like a mix between a mood board and a service journey. So it also helps create sort of this common understanding when you discuss with, with other team or people or people in the organization, like what this experience is going to be like. From your experience, have you seen that it's better to focus on a single trend like sustainability or should we like just take five trends and try to infuse our service with all these five trends? That's a good question. I think for uh, for existing brands that kind of have a strong brand presence and brand values, it's about being able to choose the trends that fit with sort of like a brand match, you could say. Um, but I think also it's you could have some really uh, large scale trends that are obvious, and then you can have like smaller trends that are interesting. And I think as a service designer, you have to be the one that sort of uh, chooses and mixes a bit between this to create your own interpretation of it, if you could say so. And I think again, like yeah, you said, like these large scale trends, like sustainability becomes yeah, like a mainstream, it becomes something that's obvious, like every new service now should be in some way promote mm -hmm. sustainable, you know, some, some kind of sustainability, but then you might look at the smaller trends. And so how can we sort of infuse these to make it even like it's a, a sustainable service, but that actually resonates with me, you know, or different users. That identity part, the mm. part about res resonating with who I am is I mm -hmm. think super important. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah, again, thinking for instance about clothes, like, yeah. there are a million, I don't know, sweaters or t-shirts or that I can buy. And why did I go for, I don't know, this bamboo shirt, right? Exactly. That's, uh, that's trying to express probably who I am in, in one way or the other. Um, mm. And you briefly mentioned something about brands and that made me think, like, what is the interplay between these two things? Because probably the marketing department here will say, people choose our products and our services because of our brand, mm -hmm. rather than because they are linked to, to trends. So wh what, is the, what is the relationship between brands, branding, and the stuff that we just talked about? Mm -hmm. I think... So you know, for some brands, there's a very direct connection coming back to what you said this now is that about, you know, the products that these brands design are part of creating popular culture as well. So, so for some brands, I think there's really strong alignment. And I think that, uh, um, even though you have a strong kind of brand, uh, you know, you have a strong brand, you could still, um, tweak this experience, the, the experience or your new services to to new or to trends and new trends, but I think it's probably perhaps also as interesting for brands that perhaps you know new brands like new services that are trying to uh, make it on the market. Like how can they offer experiences that are competing with these large brands um, in some way, especially when it comes to to yeah for example in fashion we see services for you know reusing things or repairing things they have to like really be good at offering great experiences so that they also can compete with the established brands that are that are sort of so interconnected with popular mm. culture personal question is what are some of the trends that you are excited about right now yes um there are quite a few i just pull forward one I think which is important and I think is some there are a lot of trends that are start as trends and as I said they become sort of more like a part of our everyday um, lives but uh, recently there's at least in service innovation and technology there's been a huge focus on uh, women's health like women's health and women's well-being which I find really interesting you see new services popping up 
for like Ula, Wildflower, Vira, like that are sort of catering women's needs in different phases of uh, our lives. So women's health is like, you know, we have um, all these different stages we go through. We have pregnancy, you have menopause, and there's a lot more focus on this now. And there's a lot more, um, yeah, sort of tailored services that offer these holistic experiences that really kind of um, understand these different needs. So it's not about, you know, health as one big thing. It's about understanding how these can shift in line with um, different phases of your life. And I think, so another really interesting thing is sort of the potential that lies in this, if we start looking at that. So one thing is you have different services, but you could also start to think of I saw this um Norwegian training like workout studio and they were it was just an advertisement but they're talking about how women could uh, work out differently during like a cycle um so you know you can start thinking about so how could we use this to offer like different type of subscriptions how can we use this to type offer different type of classes so there's lots of I think there's lots of exciting and interesting potential there that hasn't been fully explored. And this is, uh, I think, a great and practical example. Like if you uh, stay in the surface realm, mm -hmm. if you are a fitness studio, mm -hmm. it's just as easy for you to look at trends and connect to that. You don't have to be, I don't know, an Uber, an Airbnb, like you don't have to be a huge brand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can find something that's sort of relevant to your core offering. And then how can we expand on that? Like, how can we see all our different parts of our service and and uh, infuse these, if you could yep. say so, with some kind of popular culture? And, and it, it could be small things like just tiny interactions, or it could be larger things like events or, you know, physical touch points. One last example that came to my mind was, mm -hmm. There are a lot of uh, holiday options these days that sort of help you to reconnect with nature. Yes. Like in the Netherlands, we have vacations that you can actually stay at a farm and yes. be amongst the cattle and, <laughs> and with the farmer and sort of get your fresh eggs straight out of the chicken almost. Yeah. So that connects to, I guess, a trend where people want to reconnect with nature. So definitely million, million of options. Yeah, definitely. what would be, uh, you already mentioned something about how to start. Um, is there, a, a, you mentioned something about a tool that you developed, any other tips for getting people up to speed and, and bringing this into their, again, into their practice? It could be, you know, just starting conversations about it. It could be just acknowledging the sort of emotional, meaningful aspect of uh, of your service. Um, it could be sort of looking beyond the functional, what meaning, what value are we bringing to our users? And uh, discussion is always good. I think um, one thing that I worked a bit with was also like concept, like service concept development, like just starting to uh, find trends and just do quick sort of concept sketches on what could this look like? Because I, I saw that at, at least in larger organizations, these were great sort of tools for prompting conversations, mm. right? Because you can start seeing something, you start discussing it. And um, it's a bit like in the car industry, right? You would have concept cars and you would have like these huge shows where car brands would just like show newest technology, uh, future cars that would never be produced, but it's a way of showing that this is where we're going and this is what's possible, you know, with with technology or with materials or with, with whatever. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I find that really interesting also in service design, like how could you use these sort of concept services as a way of starting to discuss more strategic strategic decisions. I, I love this example. I don't know if it uh, moves into design fiction because mm -hmm. I don't know too much about design fiction, but I absolutely can see an, um, an exercise where you would, if we stick with the fitness studio, yep. uh, think about the trend of woman, women's health. Mm -hmm. How would a fitness studio look there? But also, reconnecting with nature, how would a yes. fitness studio look that uh, does that? Exactly. And then you can pick eight other trends and sort of- Yeah, yeah exactly. Just to, just to open the opportunity space uh, yeah. and the solution space and think about what what if, right? Yes, that's, yes, I guess, that's the great. exercise. Yeah. yeah, that's a great exercise. I think that's mm. super. And then yeah. what if, and then, and then sort of being able to 
define sort of how that would influence all these parts of the service. So yeah, I think that's a great exercise. That's a great exercise. Mm. Yeah, I, I would agree. Yeah. If somebody made it all the way to this moment in our conversation, what is the mm -hmm. one thing you hope that they will remember and walk away with? I think um, I think I hope people sort of understand that um, popular culture can offer a, it can offer you sort of a source of call it inspiration, for example, as a designer, and that by sort of implementing or using popular culture influence you can um yeah you can sort of design for experiences that hopefully people find valuable and and connect with um and um and in this sort of also that we haven't talked much about this but as a service designer you know you are translating cultural meaning you are kind of a mediator and you are part of shaping culture so it, I think it's important for people in the, in practice or to at least reflect upon. I, I, yeah, thank you for bringing this in, and I love it because I think in still in the service design space, we don't really have a good vocabulary about the design materials that we're working with, mm. time, uh, relationships, yeah. uh, people, yeah, but also adding trends and rituals to our palette. Mm. It it becomes, it bec I don't know. It becomes easier. You sort of see what the things are that you can influence. So, great. Thank you, thank you, Claire. Thanks for coming on and sharing this with us. Uh, and I hope a lot of people will get inspired and uh, start using trends, and uh, will be able to see more pop culture embedded inside the services that we use. Yes, thank you so much, Mark. Great conversation. What is the trend that you'd like to incorporate in the services that you are designing? Leave a comment down below and let's learn from each other. I want to give a huge shout out to Claire for coming on the show and sharing her learnings with us. By getting a better grasp on what the materials are that make up the services around us, we can take our craft to the next level. My name is Mark Fontaine and I want to thank you for spending a small part of your day with me. It was an absolute honor and pleasure. Please keep making a positive impact and I'll catch you very soon in a brand new episode of The Service Design Show.